Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 162 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. People define the medieval in all sorts of different ways, from architecture to religious belief to societal structures. But there's one very important element that helped to make the Middle Ages what it was, lending its name to chivalry itself, the horse. This week, I spoke with Dr. Anastasia Ropa and Dr. Timothy Dawson about horses in the Middle Ages. Anastasia is a guest lecturer at the Latvian Academy of Sport Education and the author of many papers on medieval horses, especially as they appear in Arthurian literature. Timothy is a similarly prolific writer on ancient and medieval horsemanship, pairing his work with reconstructive archaeology. Together, they've edited a collection called The Horse in Pre-Modern European Culture. Our conversation on the role of the horse in the Middle Ages, where you could get hold of one, and what we can learn by experimenting with medieval equestrian techniques is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Anastasia and Timothy, for coming on to talk about horses in the Middle Ages. It's a pleasure to meet you both. Pleasure to be here. Yes. Well, let's start at the very beginning, and that is horses in medieval Europe. Who owns them? Who has horses at this time? Obviously, this is something that changed over time. There have always been a bit of an expensive indulgence. So initially, in the early medieval period, they were relatively rare, partly because in the earlier period, they didn't really have cavalry as we understand it. So its military applications were a bit more limited. They were all essentially for Vikings, Saxons, and across most continental Europe in the period after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, they were more mounted infantry. So the richest fellows could get to their battlefield more quickly and easily, but they weren't necessarily fighting on horseback. So it was only a bit of an indulgence for them, and even fairly aristocratic men might otherwise walk. But it grew and spread and trickled down the the social hierarchy. And towards the end of the medieval period, you're getting horses moving much more into agriculture and general travel, obviously spreading across a wider range of the the social strata. Yes. And I wanted to add that some parts of the medieval world didn't have good natural conditions for breeding horses, like India and China, they have only some regions where you could successfully breed horses. So they would have to import uh, much of their quality horses. And it means these horses would be only available to the elites. And uh, local people would use oxen for agriculture. Actually, oxen were used in parts of Europe until even the 20th century. Either oxen or like smaller ponies, but even these were not uh, used everywhere. Yeah, something that you're getting at, I think, is that even though horses as a general category were used for all sorts of things from warfare to being draft horses, there isn't one type of horse in medieval Europe, is there? No. A little hard to recover the sort of precise notion of breeds and the fair amount of debate about whether you can even talk of breeds in that period in any sense we recognize today. But they certainly had horses for courses as the saying now is Mm -hmm. the way i usually explain it is that today we don't have a breed of dressage horses or a breed of show jumpers even race horses are not a breed although we use usually one type of one breed of uh, horses for racing but you can have a a race horse who later becomes a show jumper so in the middle ages you could have a horse with, with which you start as a one type of horse, and you realize it's it's not really good at this occupation. It's not a breed. It's a type which includes training, conformation, and it all goes into, into this horse. But its offspring could do other things. It's not a breed in this sense. Regionally, there were, hor- there were some regions which were go- well-known, like Frisia. Horses of Frisia were well-known. Horses of Livonia were also quite famous locally, Iberian horses. But today, when we talk about breed, it's usually implied that there is a stud book. You record all horses of your breed into the stud book and so on. And this didn't happen until the 15th century in Italy, uh, when they started to really have stud books for the horses they bred. Right. And Anastasia, some of the work that you are doing in the book 
that we're talking about today was on how to value horses. So what were some of the factors that went into the valuation of horses? It's really hard sometimes to understand the evidence, but obviously breeding. So if you had to import a horse, then it's naturally more expensive. Also where, from where you import a horse. Irish horses were generally cheaper and horses from places like France and Spain were more prestigious. Of course, it's the use of a horse was important. If a horse has the qualities of a destrier or a uh, the three means a war horse that requisite training which could take years and it would be more expensive than a horse who is taught to pull the cart and that's it but also there were things like subjective factors even today we could sell a horse for an exorbitant sum of money and why because somebody thinks it would make a good race horse and it's not necessarily true but somebody thinks it looks this way so in the middle ages there was this subjective factor and something which I have discovered uh, is the hierarchy of colors. So if your horse is the right color, it may fetch much more money than the horse with the same physical and mental quality, but of her own color. Like horses which are completely black without white marks were considered to be connected with the devil, like mm -hmm. just like black cats today. You could try and make a white mark on this horse like by burning it with uh, some chemical like appliance or if you happen to have a horse which is dark bay with beautiful white markings it would be expensive also silver gray horses they were also very beautiful to look at we still think about gray horses the white horse as something special they also fetched higher price did you want to add anything timothy or <laughs> Well, I mean, white horses have always been an elite indulgence right back into the Roman Empire. And uh, certainly for the enduring Roman Empire in Constantinople, it was the standard mount for the emperor on any official occasions. And that's replicated across courts across Europe and persists even into modern day. You have in, in historical, recent historical times, prominent men conspicuously riding white horses in triumphal parades and things when they might not necessarily have ridden one for any other time. Yeah, it's funny how things like that last so long, ideas like that. And there's lots of animals in the Middle Ages that are mysterious and powerful and they're usually white. <laughs> yeah. So a, a question that I often get asked is, who is breeding horses at this time? You want to say something about that, Anastasia? I'll have to think about it because it's not something I've looked at quite so much. I think it's a little bit like today. Everybody who have horses and land could breed horses, and quite often they did. Peasants could breed horses for their own consumption to replace the animals they have, and peasant mares would be working throughout pregnancy in Europe. But of course, if you want an elite horse and you need special facilities, just like today we had a huge breeding facility. So there is a very interesting project on the medieval war horse and they have been looking at the royal breeding studs in England. So European elites didn't ride mares, so they were not very fond of riding mares, let's put it this way, throughout <laughs> the Middle Ages. And uh, there is also quite good practical explanation because well American give only one fall a year so if you can afford it it's better to keep mares for breeding and to ride stallions stallion could engender a theoretical unlimited number of falls actually a, a very large number of falls through the breeding season then stallions are a bit expendable and you need to take care of these mares even though you don't really work them. So basically, you, if you're a noble person, you have quite a lot of money, I would say, or a king, then you would have breeding stud or studs. Where the mares, they could either be let loose in a royal park or kind of this land holding. Another possibility is that in some places like New Forest in England, where they still keep horses in the wild, these horses could be running wild in the forest and you just put a stallion with them for a month or a couple of weeks or a season in the summer and that's it. 
<laughs> so actually, this practice has survived in, in New Forest today, but it was uh, common in Europe. I know that there is a question that a few of the authors in this book are grappling with, and that is, what kind of affection do people have for their horses? So you were working on Destria's Anastasia. And so when a knight was introduced to his horse, what age was the horse? Was it right when they are full? Is it a knight is getting to know his horse or is it after training? We've just been discussing this question about horse and rider relationship. I've been in a conference in France in this year in a medieval castle, actually, very nice. And the conference was about horse and rider relationship. And we think that probably you start to ride with an adult horse, a horse who is already trained and experienced, just the way we teach children today. And then at some point, you might want to train your own war horse when you are experienced enough possibly as a teenager so for example we know there is a manual of medieval horse marshal Jordanus rufus who is writing to his emperor uh, the emperor of sicily as if the emperor is going to train you, his own horse and he recommends that you take care of your horse this and this way so probably if you want a faithful companion you would want to know it from its birth but when you are a kid it, it's probably not the best thing to <laughs> start with, with a horse who uh, hasn't been mounted and a kid who hasn't mounted a horse. <laughs> One interesting piece of information, I don't, haven't really found evidence for it, but certain historians think that in the medieval Rus at the time of Alexander of Neva, that young noble boys would have to kind of break in or train their first horse at the age of 12, 13. So this would have been a rite of passage. I haven't found evidence confirming this. But it would be possible to do, and it could, of course, constitute an interesting rite of passage where you get your own horse. Yeah, I think that idea of bond is really important because often people talk about destriers, especially as being tanks or cars or things like that, but they're not. They're creatures, and I think that there is a bond there, definitely. If I might take a step back to the previous question. In the area I'm most familiar with, as well as there being imperial estates. It's noted that one of the, the major sources of all sorts of equids actually were monastic, that the monasteries would sometimes keep major herds. We have a military manual that actually talks about requisitioning dozens and dozens of horses and mules from the monasteries to go on campaign with. But they also had a system that's analogous to the feudal system in the sense of military land holdings. And if you look, think about that, well, they're obviously raising their own horses on their own land because they're primarily fulfilled in cavalry. But then if troops are also getting horses requisitioned from monasteries, there must be a lot of, if you like, unbonding or you know, using the best you can get rather than the ideal scenario we're talking about of, of having this sort of long-term mutual association. Yeah, I think the idea of monasteries, it makes a lot of sense to me, although this is not my particular field, but it makes a lot of sense to me in that monasteries have a lot of consistency over time, right? Where you would have, you could go back and back and back to a monastery, whereas land holdings and, and knights and lords might shift over time, <laughs> maybe not as stable as a monastery as a place to find your breeding horses. Now, Timothy, yes. you worked on this book on baggage horses. I don't know if this is something that you work on a lot, but why should we learn more about baggage horses, do you think? Well, without baggage animals, nothing would have happened. Mm -hmm. You were being restricted to, to what could be carried on the backs of you know, individual men. And the roads, particularly through the early Middle Ages, a lot of the Middle Ages were not brilliant. And so while they did have wagons and and carriages right back into the Roman era, when they could use them, was quite distinctly limited. And so an enormous amount of the everyday commerce traffic and uh, travelling and military logistics was necessarily done on the backs of horses, donkeys and mules. Yeah, it's tricky. It's hard to imagine an army getting anywhere without pack animals. And so you've built some experimental saddles, right? What is a saddle made of in this time? As through most of history, wood, there's a certain amount of evidence that for baggage animals, they didn't even bother with having any kind of particular structure. Because if you just had your 
particularly softer things mounted in sacks, you could then just sling them across the back of the animal. And there, there are practical reasons why this might be a good idea in the sense that you immediately know one critical factor is your load lopsided because it'll slide off. Yeah. And whereas if you were tying it onto a pack, onto a saddle, you wouldn't necessarily know. And that over the long term of a journey, a lopsided load is going to be very bad for the animal. And also on occasions when, for instance, if the animal got spooked and ran off, the untethered baggage could fall off and at least you wouldn't lose that while you went hunting for the animal if you could possibly find it. But other than that, there were various kind of very simple wooden framed structures strapped onto the backs of the animals and the pad underneath, the forms of which in many cases can be documented as being essentially unchanged over thousands of years. Yeah, when you figure something out that works, you don't want to mess with it too much. And that no, brings indeed. you <laughs> that brings me back to Anastasia for a second. So we were talking about destriers and in this book that's what you're working on when a knight is riding across a whole lot of terrain to get to a battle site for example, is he riding his destrier at this time? That's a good question, actually, but I think if a knight is wealthy enough to afford a destrier to ride on campaigns, then he would probably have a different horse to ride. But we shouldn't be thinking that all knights were riding war horses. It's only in romances that we have a knight mounted on a war horse. In real life, we have knights mounted on a variety of animals. And we have this wonderful source from medieval England administrative documents of two kinds. One of them was evaluations of horses, which were mastered for campaign. Each horse would be evaluated. And then if the animal is killed or incapacitated or lost, the king will repay you. And the other sources, of course, when knights are being repaid or when they're claiming the values of their horses. From this, we know that it's usually only the top people in each particular team that would have a destrier and the rest of them could have coursers or rounces. Sometimes there is uh, just equus written, so horse, what, uh, whatever it means, but it seems that equus in these accounts has a particular meaning because it, it's not random. In the price, it's, I think it's below course or above rounces, so it's a particular horse that they think about when they write tackles. So today it's just a horse. <laughs> One thing to bear in mind in this is there's a common idea that knights were rich. Whereas if you're talking about the early age of chivalry, it very often wasn't the case. Knights didn't actually become considered to be part of the aristocracy in England until the second half of the 13th century. Before that, they were just fighting men with a particular vocation, and they were often sufficiently poor that they might not even own their own arms and armour, let alone a horse, and would pledge themselves in fealty to a, a richer knight or to a lord to get all the gear. Now, whether they're being supplied with a riding horse along with their war horse seems a bit unlikely frequently. So, you know, they are either riding their war horses such as they are to battle, or if they need to preserve their condition, they're walking, leading the horse. Yes, exactly. And this is probably one of the reasons why if you captured someone in a tournament in the earlier part of the Middle Ages when they started having tournaments, a horse would be one of the things that you could get because they are expensive, right? How expensive are we talking? I mean, I know it's going to range, but this is something that you were looking at in the book, especially, I think, Anastasia, right? How much are they worth? Of course, it's, you have to look at relative value. It's, it's very expensive. It's more expensive than a very expensive car today, because apart from the horse, you have all the equipment that goes with the horse. We don't know if the equipment was made for each specific horse, but we know today that you cannot use the same saddle and the same bridle on all horses. So at least it had to match at least approximately the horse type of its body, the size of its head. And of course, the, the more expensive, the more money they have, the more likely they are going to have something special made for its horse. Depends on how rich you are, of course. Just to put it into perspective, 
based on Jordan's Rufus, I have been trying to calculate how much time you need to get a workhorse. It's at least four years from the point you decide, I want a workhorse, I want my mare to conceive a workhorse, to the point where you could start riding it. But it's usually more. Talking to people who are doing jousting today and to people who are the experimenting with mounted fighting, you would realistically think of six to seven years if you have this uh, time. If you're very poor and suddenly there is no supply of horse, you can take a younger horse. But if you want to joust, then you probably have money and you probably want to prepare this, don't want to risk your life. So you have to think about the fact that it takes a lot of time to raise this horse. The training for Rufus starts when the horse is age two. So three years, that's for breeding. And then three or four more years when you or your people are working with this horse. Rufus says that you should do your work yourself if you really want to have a good horse. Mm -hmm. So three years of your own work and you think about whether you have affection for this animal or not, probably you do. Yeah, I would think so. The idea of jousting brings up A cool point that Timothy and I were talking about. Timothy, you were talking about a specific type of saddle that people were using in tournaments before they were using the tilt barrier. Can you tell us about that saddle? Because that sounds pretty cool to me. Yes, certainly. There's a wonderful manuscript that's now in the Bodleian Library that was made in the first half of the 14th century that shows us that by that time, the varieties of saddle, there are definitely at least three different varieties of saddle. That evolution probably predates that by a considerable amount, but the evidence is much more tenuous earlier on. So you've got simple hacking saddles that are not terribly different from modern ones. You've got your classic war saddle, high front and back, but relatively open. And then you've got these remarkable innovation of jousting saddles that have enormous tubular leg defences projecting down from the front. And the reason being that when you're jousting, which involves charging at each other with lances, of course, you're not in that period using a tilt barrier. So there's nothing to stop the horses diverging from their optimal line and bringing you a bit closer together than you really intended to be. And then your legs come into collision. And even though they're encased in steel, you're talking about an enormous amount of impact that could cause quite severe injuries so they start protecting them by building these into the saddle and this becomes a trend that runs right through into the later 15th century after that the tilt barrier becomes much more routine and they they don't need it so much partly it's because the one persistence was that you've got two kinds of joust you've got your sport joust where you just charge at each other you break your lance You go down to the other end of the field, you get another lance, you do it again, ad nauseum. And that's the kind of thing you see in standard jousting displays to a modern time. But other than that, you have the joust of war, which harks more back to what jousting was invented for, which is practice for battles. So you start off charging at each other with your lances. As they're broken, you then go into the melee where you draw your swords and you're generally scored on the number of hits you can land on your opponent. And then you're wheeling around each other, breaking off, turning back. And so the tilt barrier would be in the way in that point. So that style of just of war persisted longer and still they kept on using these leg protecting saddles through that period for that reason. (laughs) <laughs> that will be really difficult to get out of, I think. You don't want to fall over in those saddles because your legs are stuck. Yeah, well, there's, in, in that manuscript I'm talking about, there is one scene where a joust has gone horribly wrong. One of the horses is, and riders going down really spectacularly, and it's beautifully illustrated because the look of shock and horror, not just on the faces of the knights, but on the faces of the horses is precious. <laughs> I love those illustrations. So we've been talking a lot about horses being used for war. We've been talking about them out in forests and pastures and stuff. Let's talk about the city. What does the city look like in terms of horses? Do we see horses everywhere in the city? I think it would be relatively limited because, I mean, the the medieval cities are very crowded. So you would probably actually be more likely to see mules and donkeys bringing goods in than a lot of horses carrying riders. 
least that's the way I see it. Perhaps Anastasia would, would disagree. Yeah, I mean, it would depend on also on the part of Europe where you are looking. For example, I'm in Latvia, medieval Livonia. It's pretty far to the north. And donkeys don't do here very well because it's quite wet and cold in the winter. So first, in Northern Europe, I don't think donkeys were used that much. And hence, you would have you would see if you are mules, but horses could be doing much of the same work, for example. So some types of horses, not, not very elite ones, were used for this very important work of sanitation. Also in the Welsh law, you have the dung mare. So that, that's the least expensive horse, the mare who is only good to pull the cart full of manure. That's important to make the city run. I know that in Riga, which is the capital of medieval Livonia, it's still the capital of Latvia today, the work of filling this cart would fall to the city execution and his helpers. <laughs> and uh, yeah, maybe this poor Dangmar would be pulling also other creatures in the cart. <laughs> that is a bad job. No matter how you look at it, it just never gets better. No. You don't want to be a Dangmar. No. <laughs> Well, one of the other questions that I often get asked is, if you don't have a horse and you need one, where do you get one? Can you rent them? In the city. Again, it would depend on the point in history, but towards the end of the Middle Ages in Europe, like uh, in these Luxembourgian cities, there was a horse rental service. Especially if you're a messenger, you're on state duty, you could rent a horse and return it. Other than that, I don't think there were lots of options other than buying your own horse or a mule or a donkey if you don't have the money. Although if you are a knight, then you shouldn't be buying mules or donkeys or mares. Yeah. They're the worst kind of animals. Don't want to be seen on them. <laughs> That's right. That's just embarrassing as a knight. Although you do see priests, I think, with mules and donkeys more because they're trying to be feeling humble. So this brings me to a question where in later centuries, we know that people were keeping their horses in kind of a central place if they didn't have space within a town. Is this something that's happening in the Middle Ages? Where are people keeping their horses? I think those people who are wealthy enough to own horses would be likely to have more substantial premises on the outskirts of the city. Then they might well have a townhouse in the middle. And maybe that would have a stall if for traveling in in and out when they needed to if they were not prepared to walk it and then otherwise their more substantial horse holdings would be on the more open areas outside the city because we have to bear in mind that cities back then were nothing like the size that we tend to be used to nowadays so you know, easy walking distance in many cases even for quite a large city Yes, and I would agree with Tim. If you are breeding animals, this is definitely happening somewhere outside the city, often quite far away. And in the city, you would only keep the horse that you need for riding, like everyday riding. Yes, you have to be wealthy to afford this space for your horse. And they eat a lot too, don't they? They you don't have... just eat. There is something that comes out of the other end, and that's another problem to dispose of in the cities. Yes. And another thing to bear in mind is how much they drink. I remember sitting in on a, a, an academic discussion on the logistics of crusading, and for the course of this day, it kept circulating round to the question of how would you transport your horses if you're putting them in ships, how much water do you have to load for them? And as Anastasia was saying, how much of the waste product do you have to shovel out of the hole? Yes, I can't imagine how much you would have to, how many trips it would take up and down a ladder or some stairs to get it all out of the ship's hold. But that's a really important question. And this is one of the things I was going to ask you both is you're both horse people. And that's one of the things that's mentioned in the introduction of the book to the people who wrote the contributions in this book, they're horse people. Why is that important to studying such a time that is so far back? Why is it still important to be a horse person when you're looking at this material? Well, this has been sort of my hobby horse, so to speak, for a long time, not just in this, but in so many areas of history. If you're studying the mechanics of everyday life, 
it really helps to have relevant experience that you can bring to bear. Even if it's not you know, exactly the same, it gives you a practical mindset that allows you to make, in many cases, more reliable interpretations of the source material. I think kind of yes, it doesn't, doesn't always make your conclusion waterproof or bombproof, but it definitely helps. I think almost all contributors were horse people, except for John Clark, who is not a horse person, but who has a lot of experience of talking among other things to horse historians. And uh, he's been working on horses so much, I, I guess by now he knows about horses as much as we do. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that it's intuitive, but I wanted to ask you for your take on that, because I think for many years, things like experimental archaeology were looked down upon. I don't think that's the case so much now, but maybe maybe you have a different perspective on that. But I think that it's really important to live history in a lot of ways when you're working with something as practical as a horse, right? Yes, it also suggests questions to ask that might not occur to someone who was not familiar with the activity, whatever it is, horse riding, martial arts, and so on. So this brings me to my last question, perhaps the most difficult question. <laughs> that is, when you're trying to learn about horses, in a time that is so far back, where do you look? Where do you find material? Because I know that it's a challenge sometimes. Horses are not named or you don't get a lot of description of them. So where are you looking to find information about these historical horses? Anastasia has done much more work on source material than I have. Yeah, so horses are a little bit everywhere in the medieval world. So you have to look everywhere. I started as a scholar of Arthurian romance, so horses are always there on the periphery and always they are invisible. One particular romance is the quest for the Holy Grail. It's a middle French narrative. And at one point I had lots of time. So when, as I was reading, I was noting every time the word for horse was occurring. And there was only a handful of specific words which were related to horse type. Most of the time they, they just mounted a horse, a cheval. It's usually like today, I. I went there, I went somewhere else. There was such an important part that they are basically invisible. And sometimes you get a glimpse of, of a horse and you realize that it's important. If it's mentioned that the horse is eating this and that food, that it's only eating grass, it means that there is nothing else available because the night is at a hermitage. The hermit doesn't keep horses or other domestic animals. So it's just grass for them. It's like fasting day for a working horse mm -hmm. and uh, probably for the working night. Well, you can look at visual sources of so horses are there because it's part of life. Archaeological record, it's very interesting. There are lots of things that don't get interpreted correctly. As I'm not an archaeologist, but I understand it's a joke among archaeologists. If you find something, you don't know what it is. It's either ritual or it's horse related. <laughs> and lots of these things haven't been identified. It's just horse related something. A Scandinavian archaeologist told me that part of spurs were identified as candlesticks because they were broken off. And somebody said it's safe that the figurine must be a candlestick. They are part <laughs> of spurs. So the evidence is there. It's just waiting to be looked at by horsey eyes. <laughs> On my side, my major thing is pictorial material all the way through in most of my areas of study. And uh, that's always a, a, an interesting exercise to sort of parse out the things that are artistic license or dramatic representations or things that the illustrator were just guessing at. So there's always sort of a wonderful, delicate balancing act there. But now and again, and getting back to the practical side of things, you look at something in a, a manuscript picture and you think, well, I don't see how that can work. And then you try it and find, oh, right, that's how it works. I mean, one of the revelations in terms of this years ago was you get these pictures and little figurines of, of 12th, 13th century knights. And you look at the proportions and you think, well, you know, the, the, obviously the artist thinks the man's more important, so he's making him bigger. But I have a photo from when we were riding way back when of one of our guys in full 13th century knight's kit on this 14-hand cob. 
suddenly the proportions make complete sense. And even though you're talking about a, you know, a, a, an average sized young man of uh, 75 to 80 kilos with 30 kilos of gear on, horse has no trouble dealing with it. It's there, it's chunky, it's ready to do the business. And it looks just like these little figurines. So <laughs> not necessarily that out of proportion at all. Yeah, it's interesting how you test these things out. And you do have to be careful with art because we've all seen bestiaries and <laughs> those animals don't necessarily resemble real animals. But yes. I was thinking about coming at this through literature and I came at medieval studies through literature too. And I just remember studying Lancelot, the poem Lancelot with a woman who is Frisian and she just hated Lancelot because he always rode his horses into the ground. <laughs> So it just goes to show that, you know, people have an affection for horses that lasts a long, long time. But thank you so much to both of you for coming on to talk about horses. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. To find out more about Anastasia's work, you can visit her page at bangor.academia.edu slash Anastasia Ropa. You can find Timothy's work at independent.academia.edu slash Timothy Dawson or at seatsofempire.com. Their essay collection is The Horse in Pre-Modern European Culture. Since Peter Konechny is on the road this week, he's not available to give us the scoop on what's new with Medievalist.net. So instead, let me just take a second to remind you that there are loads of scholars who contribute articles there, including yours truly under the tag 5MINMedievalist, so there's always something new to learn. Through his Patreon site, Medievalist.net is supporting an ever-increasing group of podcasters like me. So if you're a patron, thanks. You're helping to make it possible for me and others to bring you history on the regular and to spread the good word about the amazing era that was the Middle Ages. And of course, you can always get goodies like magazine subscriptions and maps, so it's win-win. To get in on the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from horses to houses, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabelski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening and have yourself an amazing day. Mm-hmm.